A booming earthquake. Flashes of lightning and the sky gets covered with black boiling clouds. A prolonged tremor shakes the ground, sprinkles the dust. The zone is lit up by an extremely bright flare, which seems to last forever. And then comes the wave. Red clouds which engulf everything, leaving only a trail of death and destruction. Hello stalkers and welcome to the Anomalous Dugout. As you have guessed already, this new episode of our lore and theories will be about blowouts, also known as emissions. This video will contain heavy spoilers for all three stalker games, as well as references to a few other videos we have done. If you've not seen them, you will still be able to understand everything, but if you are interested in these subjects and want to see the most of all of its aspects, I suggest watching them. The links will be in the description. With that said, let's start with our subject. In this video, we will discuss the origins and nature of the blowouts, their known history in the world of Stalker, as well as their consequences and effects on the zone. We will not cover the effects of the blowouts on people and living creatures, as this will be the subject of the next Lore and Theories episode. Alright, so what is a blowout exactly? In the words of Lebedev, A normal emission is the release of energy accumulated in the zone, a discharge if you like. We don't get much more info on the nature of emissions in the games, but hopefully we have the old design documents from the developers. In the file for Oblivion Lost, the game that would become Shadow of Chernobyl, one can read, quote, In equal time periods throughout the zone, there goes waves of gravitational blowout in combination with sharply increased psychotropic impact. During this activity, abiding in the zone is mortally dangerous. Invisible waves piercing the entire territory. It takes seconds for a man without special equipment to die. Earth shaking followed by a series of flashes. Brightly lit skies and world in black and white. Eyes refusing to resist the blinding sun. At the time of blowout, one can see phantom formations and haze in spots of gravitational anomalies. After the blowout, anomalies and artifacts get generated. New packs of monsters are created. End quote. Of course, this description does not entirely fit the final concept of emissions, and what is written here is not 100% canon either, but the general idea is here. A blowout is a wave of energy, that flows into the zone, during which both physical and psychic effects take place. Anyone standing unprotected during the blowout, that is outside of a solid or underground building, will be affected by the emissions and will most likely die. Also, blowouts have other consequences on anomalies, artifacts and mutants, but we'll talk about that a bit later. If you don't know, the zone is actually a rift in the planet's noosphere, which is an informational field formed by the cognitive abilities of living creatures. The zone appeared when a group of scientists, who connected their brains to create an entity called the Sea Consciousness, tried to modify the noosphere. We talked about all of that in our video about the zone. What is interesting for our topic, however, is what happened after the disaster. This can be read in the design document for Anarchy Cell, the game that would become Clear Sky. Quote, Another part of the scientists remained in the laboratories where they united into common consciousness, which subsequently was called Sea Consciousness. Sea Consciousness saw the solution of the problem in studying the noosphere and suppressing the energy of it, which flows out on the Earth. Sea Consciousness learned to control the flow of energy coming from the noosphere. However, this energy was so immense 
that it became necessary to throw off its surplus that leads to blowouts in the zone. During the blowout, the circular wave of Noosphere's energy floats from the center of the zone to its outskirts, which leads to various both physical and psychical consequences. End quote. So from this paragraph we learn that the sea consciousness was able, to a certain extent, to control emissions. Basically, they can prevent emissions from happening too frequently, but also trigger them more often and on command. This is clearly fitting with what happens in the games, as we will see right now with the known history of emissions. The events surrounding the appearance of the zone are a little bit different depending on the source of the information, but in the end it always comes down to the same ID. Sometime in April 2006, a cataclysmic event called the Second Disaster took place. This event spawned the zone, but it does not seem to have been an emission, because according to the story, the very first emission actually happened a bit later, in June. Sidorovich is one of the few characters who talks about that first emission. He says that this emission happened when the army went to the center of the zone to try to destroy it with nuclear explosives. The blowout was extremely powerful and completely destroyed the military operation. Most of the soldiers died in an instant, and those who didn't were abandoned in the center of the zone. Most likely, they became snorks. Anyway, this suggests that the sea consciousness deliberately unleashed the emission in order to keep the military away from their business. The brain scorcher was not yet set up at the time. Also, the zone apparently grew 5 kilometers bigger because of that first blowout, but it does not mean that all blowouts make the zone expand. We've covered the topic of the expansion of the zone in another video, but here's the short version. There are rumors that the zone is growing, but no real proof. Let's get back to the history of emissions. After the huge first blowout, emissions continued to happen regularly, but they were not as powerful. We don't exactly know how much time passes between two blowouts, but I think it is a matter of months. This is hinted at by the scientist in Clear Sky opening cutscene. According to our research, the next emission will not occur for at least two months, four days and seven hours. I don't really think that they can actually calculate this with such precision, but the fact that they believe in this duration means that it is common for at least two months to pass between emissions. This also fits with the idea that the sea consciousness is trying to restrain the zone, so they probably try to decrease the frequency of emissions. However, all of this changed during the events of Clear Sky. Indeed, the game starts with a huge blowout, one so powerful that it reminded Sidorovich of the very first one back in 2006. This great emission changed the whole zone and was followed by a lot of other smaller emissions, maybe with only a few days between each emission. According to the many characters you can encounter in the game, this never happened before. Lebedev and Binpolev from the Clear Sky faction theorized that all of this was happening because someone managed to break into the center of the zone and come back alive. Of course, we know that it was in fact Strelok and his group who made their first trip to the CNPP. But the game never really confirmed if it was indeed the reason for the emissions. Hopefully we have once again the Anarchy Cell Design documents to break it to us. Quote, Sea Consciousness realizes that Strelok, who went to the door of the Monolith Control Center, possesses the information which being disclosed, can lead to the perishing of the very sea consciousness. Sea consciousness reacts with strong blowouts to any action of Strelok's grouping. The zone gets shaken with blowouts ever more often. 
Sea Consciousness starts the Stalker program, which zombifies stalkers to accomplish a certain goal. End quote. So it appears that all those emissions were indeed commanded by the Sea Consciousness, which makes perfect sense. This period of great instability in the zone ended with another huge blowout, which occurred at the end of the game. When Strelok reached the CNPP for the second time, chased by Scar and a large part of the Clear Sky faction, the Sea Consciousness unleashed once again a large emission to protect the center of the zone. Most likely, the situation and the frequency of emissions went back to normal after that. This can be seen in Shadow of Chernobyl. Considering that the game starts on the 1st of May, that the Agroprom investigation is supposed to last until the 25th, and that Call of Pripyat starts on August 3rd, we can assume that Shadow of Chernobyl takes place on a period of, let's say, around two months. Well, despite that, the only emission featured in the game takes place at the end, when the player reaches the power plant, which is also under attack by the military as part of Operation Monolith. This blowout seems to be huge and very powerful, and it was probably once again triggered by the Sea Consciousness itself to ensure the failure of the army invasion. Shortly after, Strelok allegedly destroyed the Sea Consciousness as it is depicted in the true ending of Shadow of Chernobyl. This means that no one is here to restrict the zone and the frequency of emissions anymore. The consequences of this can be clearly seen in Call of Pripyat, where emissions happen much more often, almost at the same rate as in Clear Sky, although they don't seem too powerful. Alright, that's everything we know from the timeline, at least for now. So let's move on to the effects that the blowouts have. In the description of the blowouts which we read at the beginning of the video, it was written that emissions create new anomalies and new artifacts. This fact is made very clear in Call of Pripyat, where artifacts only respond during an emission, and where the whole moving anomalies thing is actually a major plot point which is revealed by Strelok to be the reason for the crash of the military choppers. We've got a problem. Our choppers are crashing for reasons that we've not understood yet. Until we work it out, there won't be any helicopter support. The only way to get to the borders of the zone is on foot. The reasons are obvious. There are many anomalies in the air, especially in the center of the zone. We had a map with the safe air corridor between anomalies, and the helicopters had emission protection systems. That's odd. You're telling me you haven't noticed that anomalies move around after an emission. Some disappear, and new ones show up in different places, which makes your map of anomalies effectively useless. So that's what it is. What? This is also a huge deal in Clear Sky because the big emission that starts the game spawned anomalies on previously safe areas, such as the roads to Rostock, but also opened new paths that were previously inaccessible, like the bridge to Limansk. Most likely, the stronger the emission and the bigger the changes to the cartography of the zone's anomalies. Moreover, stronger emissions also means stronger anomalies and potentially more precious artifacts. For example, the blowout in Clear Sky created a lot of infamous space anomalies, which seem to be a source of the extremely rare compass artifact. Maybe you've noticed that artifacts are very similar in Clear Sky and Call of Pripyat, but they are extremely different in Shadow of Chernobyl. Indeed, artifacts in Shadow of Chernobyl can be found lying around anomalies and are visible to the naked eye, while artifacts in Clear Sky and Call of Pripyat are hidden inside anomalous zones and require a detector to be found. The appearances and stats given by the artifacts are also very different. 
Well, I believe the reason for these differences is emissions. We explained all about this theory in an older video, so I won't spend too much time on it. But here's a small extract. My theory here is that a certain type of artifact, those from Clear Sky and Call of Pripyat, appears during emissions, while another type, those from Shadow of Chernobyl, appears over time in anomalies without needing an emission to be created. Let's call them types A and B. When emissions are too frequent, type B artifacts don't have enough time to form and only type A artifacts are found. And when emissions happen rarely, only type B artifacts could be found, given that all the type A artifacts spawned in the last emission were already collected. Apart from artifacts, anomalies themselves are also affected by the frequency of emissions. From the PDA Encyclopedia, we learn that anomalies have a life duration, which means that after a certain amount of time, anomalies run out of energy and they disappear. Moreover, we know that anomalies are generated during emissions, new ones are created, and among those who were still there, some of them are recharged and become stronger, while others simply vanish. Therefore, it is possible that certain types of anomalies, which have a short life duration, will cease to exist within the zone until a new emission arrives. I think this would explain why the gas anomaly is not present in Shadow of Chernobyl. A long time passed since the last emission and all the gas anomalies expired. Now that we know all of this, it is time to make a theory on how the emissions occur. The zone is said to be a crack in the noosphere, a crack which leaks anomalous energy. However, the flow of this leaking energy is not continuous, it comes in the form of emissions. What I'm trying to say is that the crack separating the noosphere and the material world works like some sort of puppet valve. Normally, the valve is closed. As energy accumulates behind the valve, pressure builds up. When it reaches a certain amount, the valve suddenly opens, releasing the surplus of energy into the zone. It is an emission. As the pressure quickly falls, the valve closes almost instantly. And then the cycle repeats. What the sea consciousness can do is control the amount of pressure required to open the valve, how long the valve stays open, and also if the crack is just slightly open or completely wide open, well, you get the idea. When they try to restrain the zone, the sea consciousness keeps the valve closed for a long time, but when it finally has to open, the energy is immense and the blowout gigantic. On the contrary, when they want to unleash hell to, say, ruin the plans of Strelok, they can open the valve more frequently, which results in a lot of less powerful emissions. Of course, this is just a theory and probably an extremely simplified explanation of the inner mechanisms of the zone and the noosphere. But it's better than nothing. Let me know what you think about it in the comments down below. And here you have it, the first part about the missions. In the second part, which should come out in two weeks, we will take a look at the effects of the blowouts on living creatures and people. So stay tuned for that. Thank you for watching, stalkers, and goodbye.